Hi, my name is Lindsay Jaspers and I'm a postdoc in Rich DeGiulio's lab at Duke University. One of the main focuses of our lab is studying populations of Atlantic killifish that live in the Elizabeth River, which is located in Southeast Virginia. And as you can see in this picture, is heavily industrialized by commercial and military operations. The Elizabeth River experienced decades of pollution from these industries, resulting in sediments with significant chemical contamination. A major source of pollution in the Elizabeth River was a wood preservative called creosote, which is derived from coal tar and contains compounds known to cause cancer, suppress the immune system, and disrupt heart development. These effects have been well studied in Atlantic killifish, which are small fish found along the East Coast that have small home ranges, which makes them ideal for studying the impacts of local chemical contamination like is present in many locations along the Elizabeth River. We can observe the effects of these compounds on heart development in killifish embryos that are exposed to extract from Elizabeth River sediment, which contains the harmful compounds present in creosote. In a killifish embryo produced by a normal adult killifish from non-polluted reference sites, you can see the heart develops in distinct chambers, very similar to a human heart, and that allows for normal blood flow. When the killifish embryos are exposed to the sediment extract that contains the creosote chemicals, their heart shape changes dramatically. And in response to high levels of exposure, the embryos develop what is called a string heart, where the, the heart chambers are extremely narrowed, severely restricting blood flow, and sometimes leading to death of the embryo. From as early as 1995 and repeatedly in the years since, data from our lab and others have shown that Atlantic killifish from the Elizabeth River are highly resistant to the characteristic response of normal embryos that I just described, and instead develop completely normally in the presence of the compounds in creosote. These Elizabeth River killifish have been chronically exposed to sediments contaminated with creosote and therefore have evolved to survive this exposure over many generations with adaptations that protect them against the toxicity. Through many years of research, we've discovered that these adaptations are associated with fitness costs in the killifish, which could make them more sensitive to stressors like increased water temperature and decreased oxygen. The main sources of creosote pollution in the Elizabeth River were three major wood treatment facilities that operated on the river for most of the 1900s, and those were Atlantic Wood Industries, Republic Creosoting, and Eppinger and Russell. The Atlantic Wood Industries and Eppinger and Russell locations have been remediated during the last decade, so the contaminated sediments have been removed or sealed off, and the locations no longer have high levels of harmful chemicals in the sediment, but the former Republic Creosoting site remains heavily polluted. Given that the adapted phenotype of killifish comes with costs to fitness, and the killifish produce a new generation of fish every year, meaning that there have been multiple new generations in the year since remediation, we hypothesized that the adapted phenotype of killifish from the Atlantic Wood and Eppinger and Russell locations would dissipate following remediation. So we collected fish in 2019 and 2020, shown in the videos playing in the center of the screen, um, from the sites of the three former wood treatment facilities along the Elizabeth River, as well as from a reference location in a non-polluted creek, and brought them back to our lab at Duke, where we housed them and collected embryos to look at developmental effects of exposure. Exposures to sediment extract showed that embryos from killifish collected from the remediated sites continue to exhibit the adapted phenotype, with resistance to exposure the same as pre-remediation, and at similar levels as the killifish living in the still polluted Republic site. Even following exposure with incredibly high levels of the compounds, the hearts develop completely normally. This tells us that while remediation may have effectively reduced chemical pollution in the Elizabeth River, killifish at the remediated sites remain adapted to pollution through multiple generations following remediation, despite costs to fitness. We still don't know why the adapted phenotype persists, but we can speculate that it could be a result of limited genetic diversity or insufficient evolutionary pressure to revert to a susceptible phenotype. In other words, though the fish may be less fit because of their adaptations to pollution, they are still fit enough to survive in this habitat, and there's therefore no force driving them to evolve. This work demonstrates the need for continued research investigating the effects of remediation on killifish populations in the Elizabeth River in order to accurately assess ecosystem recovery following remediation.